Welcome to our class this day. I'm your instructor, Dr. D. Todd Harrison, as we continue to feast, and it has been a literal feast this year, upon the treasures and the nuggets of truth as found in the Doctrine and Covenants, the Third Testament of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the Second Testament as to the divine prophetic calling of the prophet Joseph Smith. What a wonderful year we've been having. How many hundreds of things have we learned already this year? For those of you who've been with us all year long, it's just been, we've just been basking in the wisdom of God as Jesus Christ continues to declare his testimony concerning his church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, that it is his church, that it is the only true and living church upon the face of the earth. He's continued to bear testimony concerning himself, that he did indeed die for the sins of the world. He's continued to bear his testimony that he called the prophet Joseph Smith to be his mighty servant, his mighty prophet, to bring forth his truth once more upon the earth. What a glorious year this has been. I add my testimony to that of his, that this church indeed is true. It is his church. It is the only church upon the face of the earth that has his divine authority, that has his divine approval upon it. Today we're going to see he's going to use, a, I didn't even write it down, but something like seven or eight times he's going to refer to the congregations of the wicked. I don't, I've don't. i written down passages we want to look at this week. I don't know whether we're going to get to all of them or not. But in this lesson, if you read through chapters 60 through 62, there's something like seven or eight times he refers to the congregations of the wicked. You're either... You know, the way it is, you know, all the way going back to Joshua in the Old Testament. Are you for the Lord or for the devil? You know, it choose you life or death, you know, blessing or cursing. You're either for God or you're for the devil. There's no neutrality in the economy of God. Now, you're either for God or you're for, or, you're, or it says here, you're a congregation of the wicked. If you're not a member of his church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, God himself declares seven or eight times here in just a couple of chapters that you are a member of the congregation of the wicked. Now, I know that may hurt some of you. You might feel offended, but keep in mind the great offender of all time is the Holy Ghost. Second, the greatest offender of all time is the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So the fact that these are his words, these are not the words of Joseph Smith, these are not the words of Dr. D. Todd Harrison. These are not the words of Oliver Cowdery or any other person. These are the literal words that's found in the Doctrine and Covenants are the words of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ himself declaring, if you're not a member of his church, you're a member of the congregation of the wicked. Now, what are you going to do about it? You feel offended? You feel hurt? Uh, great. That's why God wants you to feel. So that now you can take a step back and you can ponder as to your eternal salvation and whether you want to join and follow God or not. Whether you want to be a member of his church or not. Do you want to be blessed or not? Now, if you're not blessed, as the scripture teach, you'll actually be cursed because what happens, what does God consider a cursing? is when he removes his spirit from your life. That, that's it. That's all he does. Lifts his spirit from your life. You are then go to who? You then fall under the influence of as the Book of Mormon mentioned several times, the devil and his angels. So if you don't join his church, you would become a member of the congregation of the wicked. These are the words of Jesus Christ declaring this. No other person is declaring this. I'm not saying that. This is what Jesus Christ said in these uh, uh, verses. So it's very important that you reach out to the missionaries. Ask them, how can I become a member of Jesus Christ's church upon the earth? Decide you no longer want to be part of this congregation of the wicked. That you want to become a member of the righteous. You want to become a Christian. We've looked several times before through our videos last year as well as this year. There is only one way to become a Christian. A Christian, from the word Christ, means anointed. You have to be anointed. It's not a matter of simple mental uh, acceptance of the historical fact that there was a person called Jesus of Nazareth, that doesn't do you any good. Even the devils believe in Jesus of Nazareth, 
that Jesus is the Son of God. How many times in the New Testament do the devils and the possessed individuals come up and worship Jesus? We know you are the Son of God. Are you come to torment us before the, the end, before the appointed time in which we know we're going to be tormented? And James, he, James says in the epistle of James that even the devil believes. And so therefore, belief is not enough. Plus, do you truly have belief if you ex if you say, oh, I believe that if Jesus... Christ, but you're not willing to obey Jesus Christ. You're not willing to keep his commands. So if Jesus Christ says, repent and be baptized into my church, the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and you don't do that, do you truly believe in Jesus Christ? The answer is clearly no. The only way to show your acceptance of Jesus Christ, to show your true belief in Jesus Christ, is to do what he says. Jesus said in John, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So if you love Jesus Christ, you believe in Jesus Christ, you accept Jesus as your Savior, you're going to become a baptized member of his church, you're going to leave these congregations of the wicked, and then as a result, God will bless you. First thing God does, gives you a new name. That even above that, he calls you now a Latter-day Saint. So you're a Christian Latter-day Saint. God has called you now a saint. You've accepted Christ. You've accepted my son. Uh, you've been baptized in the name of my son. You've become a Christian. Now I'm going to take that even one step further and call you a saint. Now you're even a saint over other Christians uh, because you've done what I've asked you to do. And so it's my humble prayer, and I beg with you all the time, that those of you who are not yet members of the church, why continue to rob yourselves of the great joy and happiness that could be yours? Accept Jesus Christ. Become a Christian. Become a baptized member of his church. I will again put the link in the, uh, uh, the, the, the missionary link in the uh, description of this video. Just click on that link. Contact the missionaries. Tell them you're ready to become a Christian. You're ready to become a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And then God will bless you far more than you can possibly imagine, both here in this life and in the world to come when you die. Let's look this week at the Doctrine and Covenants, section 60 to 62, and we'll look at some more great nuggets of truth, some great wonderful wisdom from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He's the one that speaks in these revelations. This is not Isaiah writing. This is not Jeremiah writing. This is not, uh, you know, Moses writing. These is totally different than any other book of Scripture. The Doctrine and Covenants is Jesus Christ's teaching. We don't have that in the Old Testament. Those were prophets writing under the direction of the Holy Ghost. But Jesus Christ is not talking in the Old Testament. We don't have Jesus Christ talking in the New Testament. We may have the Sermon of the Mount. We may have some sermons that Jesus spoke and that was that were written down 40 to 100 years after he died. But we don't have the actual words of Jesus Christ. Here, and, and even what we have in the New Testament is open for debate. Did you know that scholars, a lot of scholars only view that 20% of what Jesus said and, and did in the New Testament was historical fact? That the historical Jesus, the, the Jesus that actually existed upon the earth, that he probably only taught about 20% of, the, of what the New Testament says. So you know, it's even open to debate. Here there's no debate. In the Doctrine and Covenants there is no debate. This is Jesus Christ speaking directly to his prophet who then wrote down the very next night, that same night, the next day, the very words that Jesus Christ spoke. There is no book that equal in the to the Doctrine and Covenants. No sacred book of record is equal to the Doctrine and Covenants. The Bible's not. The Book of Mormon's not. The Doctrine and Covenants stands supreme over all other uh, 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 books of Scripture. Let's look at 60, 1 through 4. Behold, thus saith the Lord, right? Koamar Adonai in the Hebrew, right? This is Jesus Christ speaking. Behold, thus saith the Lord. The Lord is speaking. Unto the elders of his church, right? His church. The church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He continues every one of these lessons as we look at the scripture material. Jesus Christ declares over 
and over and over and over again that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is his church, is his only church, as he says. Who are to return speedily to the land from whence they came. Behold, it pleases me that you have come up hither. But with some I am not well pleased, for they will not open their mouths. But they hide the talent which I have given unto them, because of the fear of man. Woe unto such, for my anger is kindled against them. God's given the people all kinds of spiritual gifts. In this case, you know, the ability to speak and to teach the words of wisdom, the words of God. And to do so with power and authority. And if you and if those who have such gifts just sit there, don't open their mouth, then God's going to be angered against you because He gave you those gifts to teach other people. And if you sit around and you don't teach other people, you're not helping His kingdom progress. You're not serving God. Let's look at verse three. And it shall come to pass, if they are not more faithful unto me, it shall be taken away even that which they have. You don't use your spiritual gift, it will be taken away from you. Uh, you know, spiritual gifts are like seeds. Uh, you know, God gives you different seeds of different kind of gifts, but then you need to develop it. Moses, uh, who parted the Red Sea, could not have parted the Red Sea if he hadn't already turned a staff into a snake, if he hadn't turned an Nile into blood, if he hadn't, you know, all the miracles, all the plagues that he did upon ancient Egypt, all helped him develop the miracle-working uh, spiritual gift to the point that he could part the Red Sea, let the Israelites go over, and then close the Red Sea to drown Pharaoh's army. He could not have done that as his first miracle. It, it, the gifts of the Spirit are things you need to work on to build, to, to build up, and then Maybe you can grow in mighty power until you can move mountains and part Red Seas. For I, the Lord, rule in the heavens above, heavens, plural, celestial, terrestrial, and telestial, just like in Genesis in the beginning, God created the heavens, plural. It starts that in the first book, in the very first uh, chapter of, of, the, of the Bible, that there's not a traditional heaven, singular, and hell. There is heavens, plural, celestial, terrestrial, and telestial. Just as Paul taught in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, the sun, the moon, and the stars. Three different uh, uh, heavens. Who's the only church upon the earth who teaches that doctrine? Who teaches the Bible, right? Because we just looked at, that's the very first uh, verse of Genesis 1-1. Right? The very first uh, verse of the Bible. Paul teaches it in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 15, of there being multiple heavens, one the glory of the sun, one of the glory of the moon, and one of the glory of the stars. Only the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the only church upon the earth who teaches such a doctrine, because the Church of Jesus Christ is the only church upon the earth who teaches biblical doctrine. Other churches take one verse of Scripture, and they build their church around that one Verse of scripture, even if they take it out of context and they t and and it makes it even contradict what the rest of the Bible even teaches. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints is the only church upon the earth who teaches the whole Bible from Genesis 1 1 through Revelation chapter 20. It's the only church who teaches the full, comprehensive biblical doctrine. We don't take one doctrine and build a church upon it. We don't choose parts that we're going to believe in and what we're not going to believe in. We don't choose parts that we only like and and, dis, and don't look at the parts we, we dislike. And, and so there again, so the heavens, right? And among the armies of the earth, and in the day when I shall make up my jewels, all men shall know what it is that bespeaketh the power of God. What a great the, the blessing that would be, that God, the faithful people who join his church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, who do everything to obey him, to keep his commandments, repent of their sins, God calls them his jewels. And just as a jewel collector is careful in, in maintaining their jewelry collection, so God is with his saints. He will treat them as precious jewels and will take great care of them. Let's look at 7 through 9. And in this place, let them lift up their voice and declare my word with loud voices. 
without wrath or doubting, lifting up holy hands upon them. For I'm able to make you holy, and your sins are forgiven you. As you preach the gospel, God has promised to forgive you your sins. He says you need to preach it without doubting. There are some people who try to teach the gospel, but they don't truly believe the gospel. You need to first build your testimony to be unshakable, without any doubt. Then you will be able to speak with the trump of an angel. Then you will be able to convert thousands or hundreds or tens uh, or uh, several uh, to the church. You know, No one should go on a mission in this church who does not have a testimony of, of, of the church and of God and of the prophet and of the restoration. You need to have no doubt, doubting not. Then you will be mighty in God's hand to preach and declare his gospel to others. You say, well, I don't have a testimony. Well, you need to start reading the scriptures. There's none. I can't think of a few uh, things can help build a testimony uh, faster uh, than reading the scriptures. You start and you read the Book of Mormon, or you read the Doctrine and Covenants, either one. And I, preferably you read both of them. As you read them, God will continue to impress upon your mind that the things you are reading are true. As you get that manifestation from the Holy Ghost speaking to your soul over and over and over again, your testimony is growing stronger and stronger and stronger. Ultimately, you take it to God in prayer. You ask him to confirm to your heart, to your soul, to your mind, whether the things that he's already borne testimony to you are true. And yet, even though he's already borne testimony to you, and you already know it's true, he's still going to then confirm it once more in, in that humble prayer. You know, it's just incredible. He wants you to know. That's why already in the last few lessons that we've been looking at, he's already declared that his church is true 38 different times, right? Because he wants to be no doubt. He, he's willing to confirm it to you as many times as it takes until you grow your testimony to be burning and, and bright. Let's look at the eight here. And let the residue take their journey from St. Louis, two by two, and preach the word. Not in haste among the congregations of the wicked, those who are not members of his church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Lord Jesus Christ has declared with his own mouth that they are members of the congregations of the wicked. Doesn't matter whether they want to call themselves Catholic, Baptist, Presbyterian, uh, Methodist, uh, Evangelical, uh, whatever it is, it's a congregation of the wicked, according to Jesus Christ here in this scripture. Let Satan not deceive you. You can call it whatever you want to call your church. It doesn't mean that it's true. It doesn't mean that it's being led by God. God himself has declared that he doesn't because he's declared in the section 1, verse 30 of the Doctrine and Covenants that the church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints is the only true and living church upon the earth. Living, the only one that receives revelation from God. So Jesus has declared over and over again in the scriptures, I only communicate to the prophet of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'm only leading the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints because that's the only church that's mine. Therefore, we need to obey, believe and obey. If you don't believe, you, you know, we saw last time that failure to believe is not an excuse. And in fact, God calls that a sin. A lot of, Most other churches even are openly willing to declare to you that there's no revelation. Well, when they say that there's no revelation, what does that mean? Well, they're openly acknowledging to you that God is not leading their church. Why would anyone want to be a member of a church that God is that that their own leaders are telling you God's not leading them? That seems silly and ridiculous and against common wisdom and, and co common uh, sense and knowledge. And and if, you know if if you're a member of something like that, you need to run away from it as fast as you can. The pastor, uh, where did he you know? What makes him think he should be a pastor? If if there's no revelation, then then he's telling you that God didn't that God did not tell him to be a pastor and and to be a church leader and to teach his word. So he has no authority from God. He's openly acknowledging he has no authority from God. He's openly acknowledging that he or she should not be preaching the word of God. They have no business doing so. 
unless you're called by revelation. But if, if your church does not receive revelation, you're not being led by God. You're not appointed by God to be one of his ministers. Okay, great. And uh, so then, uh, until they return to the churches from which, which they came. <clears throat> All right, let's look now at verse 10. And let my servant Edward Partridge and part of the money which I've given him a portion unto mine elders who are commanded to return. Notice how he always can, he calls the people of the, the, the uh, missionaries and the ministers in his church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, you know, his, my servant, Joseph Smith Jr., my servant, Oliver Cowdery, my, uh, unto mine elders, right? He's always calling them his because he's appointed them with the authority to preach and teach his word. Let's look at 12. And now I speak of the residue who are to come into this land. Behold, they have been sent to preach my gospel among the congregations of the wicked. Again, those who are not members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints are me members of these congregations of the wicked. doesn't matter what you call your church. Wherefore I give unto them a commandment thus, Thou shalt not idle away thy time, neither shalt thou bury thy talent, that it may not be known. Uh, you know, when, when he calls you to be a missionary, he wants you to dedicate those two years or a year and a half or how uh, three years of your mission present to serving him. Don't idle away the time. That's a precious time. You're not going to be a missionary for your whole life. You have a, a certain amount of time to be a missionary. And make sure you full, fully focus yourself on him and teaching his word and teaching his church during that time. So now let's look at uh, 14. And after thou hast come up into the land of Zion and hast proclaimed my word, keep calling it my word, what the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is teaching is his word. He continues to uh, teach and testify of that. Proclaiming my word among the congregations of the wicked, not in haste, neither in wrath, nor with strife. We do not debate with those of other churches. We teach and we testify of the truth. We then allow the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost will then confirm that truth to the individual. We then leave the individual up to the, make their own decision, whether they want to believe the gospel and believe Jesus Christ, accept Jesus Christ, become a Christian, or whether they're going to reject him. And shake off the dust of thy feet against those who receive thee not, not in their presence, lest thou provoke them. You don't want to make them angry. But in secret, and wash thy feet as a testimony against them in the day of judgment. Behold, this is sufficient for you in the will of him who has sent you. Again, Jesus Christ declaring, he has sent the missionaries of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to teach his word. And by the mouth of my... You look at this once again. By the mouth of my servant, Joseph Smith. It shall be made known concerning Sidney Rigdon and Oliver Cowdery, the residue hereafter, even so, amen. What a mighty powerful, it was what, not even one and a half pages. But look all the great wisdom and the knowledge and the testimony of Jesus Christ in this one and a half pages. Let's look at section 61 and we'll learn some more incredible things. And um, when they, uh, on their return trip to Kirtland, the prophet and ten elders had traveled down the Missouri River in canoes. On the third day of the journey, many uh, dangers were experienced. Elder William W. Phelps in daylight vision saw the destroyer, saw Satan, saw Lucifer, riding in power upon the face of the waters. Let's look at verse 1 through 2. Behold and hearken unto the voice of him who has all power, who is from everlasting to everlasting, even Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. So Jesus Christ once again speaking. This is not Isaiah writing down his prophecies. This is not Jeremiah writing down his prophecies. This is not Moses writing the five books of Moses or the Torah. This is Jesus Christ himself speaking to the church, his church, and speaking to the prophet. Behold, verily thus saith the Lord unto you, O ye Elders of my church, the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, who are assembled upon upon this spot, 
whose sins are now forgiven you. For I, the Lord, forgive sins and am merciful unto those who confess their sins with humble hearts. He's merciful to those who will repent and, and with humble hearts. You know, if you think you've sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and Paul taught that all of us have, approach God. You know, ask him for forgiveness with humbleness of heart, and he will be merciful unto you. He will forgive you. Jesus Christ died for you. He died so that he could, he could for, so that God will forgive you of your sins. Look at four through six. Nevertheless, I suffered it that ye might bear record. Behold, there are many dangers upon the waters, and more especially hereafter. There were already dangers in 1830. There'll be more dangers upon the waters hereafter. A great prophecy from Jesus Christ himself. What would happen in the last days? Since then, we have all kinds of typhoons, tsunamis happening, you know, uh, uh, you know all the time now, right? We, just a few years ago, we had that terrible devastation in Southeast Asia. It killed thousands and thousands of people. So Jesus Christ prophesied these dangers would come upon the waters going th 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 forward in time. Nevertheless, all flesh is in mine hand, and he that is faithful among you shall not perish by the waters. Wherefore it is expedient. Let's look at, uh, no, we move to 13. So we're going to look at 13 through 16. And now, behold, for your good, I gave unto you a commandment concerning these things. And I, the Lord, will reason with you as with men in days of old. Behold, I, the Lord, in the beginning blessed the waters. But in the last days, by the mouth of my servant John, I cursed the waters. So John cursed the waters. Wherefore the days will come that no flesh shall be safe upon the waters. And it shall be said in days to come that none is able to go up to the land of Zion upon the waters, but he that is upright in heart. And as I, the, okay, so that's 16. And now let's look at 27 through 28. Nevertheless, unto whom is given power to command the waters, unto him it is given by the Spirit to know all his ways. So we know that there have been some who God's given the spiritual gift to command the waters. Uh, uh, Franklin D. Richards, an early apostle in the church, was on his ship going across the ocean when they had a strong tempest, just like in the days of the Savior. The uh, Franklin uh, stood up at the front of the boat, commanded the the seas to you know to to calm down and the storm to stop. Uh, and guess what happened? The same thing that Jesus Christ did, right? They, they, well, they uh, they were safe, right? And the, the storm stopped and the, the horrible wind ceased. The captain was so impressed he let Elder Richards uh, use his uh, room the rest of the. The trip uh, uh, coming back over to America. And what he's saying here is that it's, it, to those who have this, this spirit, this power, you know, they should just not use it whenever they want, right? They, they have to use discretion. They'll know through the spirit when it's proper to, to do that, to command the uh, waters and when and not to. And that's what he's saying here. Unto him it is given by the spirit to know all his ways. Okay, and then in 28, Wherefore let him do as the Spirit of the living God commandeth him, whether upon the land or upon the waters, as it remaineth with me to do hereafter. Let's look at 36 through 39. And now verily I say unto you, and what I say unto one, I say unto all. God does not favor one people over another. He does not just give one gospel message to one person but not give it to the rest. Everything he speaks to one person, he speaks to all his children. And now, verily, I say unto you, and what I say unto one, I say unto all, be of good cheer. Did you know that's a commandment? Be of good cheer. He would said the same thing in the New Testament. It's a commandment, right? Be of good cheer. We are to be cheerful and happy. That is a commandment. If we're not cheerful and not happy, we're not keeping the commandments of God. We need to repent of our sins, approach God, and ask Him how He can, you know, to ask Him for for Him to help us to find joy and happiness in our lives. For I am in your midst, and I have not forsaken you. We should never 
uh, not be happy knowing that he's in our midst and he has not forsaken us. And inasmuch as you have humbled yourself before me, the blessing of the kingdom are yours. Gird up your loins and be watchful and be sober, looking forth for the coming of the Son of Man. For he cometh in an hour you think not. Now, he's been saying that for 2,000 years. But keep in mind, we learned in the, in the epistle of Peter, Peter taught that one day to the Lord is as a thousand years here. So while it's been 2,000 years since Jesus was crucified and ascended to heaven, for God, it's been two days. So saying in an hour when you think not, I'm coming. It could be, he always says he's coming soon. It's been two days. We don't know whether it's going to be a third day or a half of a day or an hour from now in, in God's time. But uh, he's saying in an hour when you think not, that's when he's going to come. Pray always that ye enter not into temptation, that ye may abide the day of his coming, whether in life or in death. Remember, the saints who have died will also be caught up into the clouds, as Paul taught in Thessalonians, to meet Jesus Christ. So whether in life or in death, you know, if you pray and prepare yourselves for this day, you'll be able to witness Jesus Christ coming. Okay, let's look at now 62. And um, he says here in verse 1, Behold and hearken, O ye elders of my church, the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. How many times? It's just marvelous how many times. We should really have started counting from the first chapter uh, this year to see how many times it refers to the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as being his church. Thus saith the Lord your God, even Jesus Christ, your advocate, who knoweth the weakness of men and know and how to succor them who are tempted. Look at three. Nevertheless, ye are blessed, for the testimony which you have borne is recorded in heaven for the angels to look upon, and they rejoice over you, and your sins are forgiven you. What a marvelous uh, the blessing and promises is. Those who are not afraid to open their mouths, those who declare their testimony in fast and testimony meeting, declare their testimony to their friends and their colleagues, uh, you know, to, to everybody, uh, that those who bear their testimony, their testimony is recorded in the heavens for the angels to look over. It says that they rejoice over you and... As you bear your testimony, God forgives you your sins. What a uh, what a great promise, a blessing is that. As you bear your testimony, it's recorded in heaven. The angels rejoice over you in your testimony. And God will forgive you of your sins. Let's look at verse 5. And then you may return to bear record, yea, even altogether, or two by two, as seemeth you good. It mattereth not unto me, only be faithful and declare good glad tidings unto the inhabitants of the earth or among the congregations of the wicked. See, if you're an, an inhabitant of the earth, as long as you, you know, live on this planet, <laughs> maybe it doesn't pertain if you live on the planet Mars or Jupiter, but as long as, as far as God's concerned, as long as you live on this planet, the planet earth, if you're not a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, you're a member of the congregation of the wicked. He said it seven or eight times just in these uh, couple of chapters uh, uh, here today. And then in verse 9. Behold, the kingdom is yours, and behold, and lo, I am with the faithful always. Even so, amen. Now, notice he didn't say he's with the congregation of the wicked. He said those who are members of the church, his church, that he keeps calling his church, right? And his people and his jewels. Those. He is with them always, says the faithful here. And behold, lo, I am with the faithful always, even so. Amen. What a great blessing. What a great promise. What a marvelous book of scripture, this doctrine and covenants, as God continues to declare his testimony, his witness concerning the truthfulness of the church, concerning the divine prophetic calling of the prophet Joseph Smith declaring that the power of priesthood and authority of God are among the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I add my witness 
I add my testimony to those things. If I can be humble enough to add my testimony to God's testimony, I declare myself that I also know that these things are indeed true. Because that same God, that same Jesus Christ, who has declared it over and over again in the Doctrine and Covenants, has also spoken to me and declared it to me that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is his only true and living church upon the face of the earth. That Joseph Smith was a prophet of God. That we currently have prophets and apostles upon the earth once more. I challenge all of you who are not yet members of the church to click on that link. Just click on that link in the description of this video. Reach out to the missionaries. Tell them you're ready for God to bless you. You're ready to be joyful. You're ready to be happy. You're ready to confess Jesus Christ before men. You're willing to do it to take place in a symbolic ritual, uh, uh, the uh, baptism representing the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ as a witness that you are taking upon yourselves the name of Jesus Christ, that you want to be his, that you want to be his people, that you want to be one of his jewels upon the earth, that you want him to always be over to watch over you and protect you and to lead you by the hand. As you do so, you will be blessed mightily by God. He has promised you great peace, great joy, great happiness upon this earth in this life, and the ability to return to live with Heavenly Father forever and ever once you leave this earth, once you leave this, this life, when you, your spirit departs uh, from your body and ultimately resurrects, you can live with God forever in his celestial kingdom on high. I love you. I uh, Nothing greater in my life than to be able to teach and to testify of the truth of God and to see many of you make the correct decisions in your life that lead you to be joyful, happy, and, and, and just do all the marvelous blessings, you know, that we continue to hear from those of you who are watching these videos, those of you who are reading the messages, the, the written messages that we send out. We love you. We pray for you. If you need any specific prayer requests, just message us, you know, on our social media. We will be glad to pray for you. Until next time, Dr. D. Todd Harrison, and I close these uh, things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.